Hey, this is Mark Goldberg with the United Nations Affairs Block, UN Dispatch. I'm very pleased to be talking today with Daryl Kimball of the Arms Control Association. Hey, Daryl. Hi there. Good to see you. Good, good. So, so maybe uh, perhaps by way of introduction, you might explain to us or what it is you do, what the Arms Control Association is, and sort of your your role there, and then we can get into things. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. the The Arms Control Association is a a small, but uh, we like to think. Uh, effective and energetic uh, organization that's been around since 1971, and we're concerned about the dangers posed by nuclear, chemical, biological, and conventional weapons. Uh, the Arms Control Association was established by some of the, uh, the men, they were all men at the time, in the 1960s, who uh, helped establish uh, some of the key treaties and international agreements uh, that we have used to try to reduce the threat of these weapons, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, Strategic Arms Limitations uh, Treaties with the Soviets. Uh, and today uh, we have uh, expanded our work into a, a range of areas, uh, non-proliferation, still on nuclear disarmament, and also some of the conventional weapons uh, that are most deadly to civilians uh, in, in wars around the world. Great. And, and you guys also put out arms control today, right? Right. We put out a 50-plus yeah. page magazine uh, 10 times a year. Uh, it mm-hmm. is uh, chock full of uh, news reports from our analysts. Uh, we have a, a staff who reports on key developments, and we also have articles from leading experts, uh, some opinion leaders, uh, interviews with key people. Yeah. We've interviewed John Bolton, Mohamed el and others, and that's available online on our website, too, uh, armscontrol.org. I, I definitely encourage readers to check out uh, Arms Control today. It's really it's a very useful um, useful uh, resource for, for these kind of issues. And uh, so, so today we're going to talk about uh, non-proliferation, the, the future of the non-proliferation regime, but also maybe uh, current threats and challenges to it. And I think maybe a, a good way to, to jump into this is, is uh, talking about something that's been in the news recently, that's uh, certainly in your orbit, which is this uh, civilian, uh, this this American Indian civilian nuclear transfer deal, right. Right. Um, and and which uh, uh, you have called, and I'm quoting here, a non-proliferation disaster of historic proportions that will produce harm for decades to come. So so maybe uh, I'll, I'll ask you maybe to explain, give us some background on what this deal is, and and why it is that you think it is such a disaster. Yeah, well, we have to remember that, uh, as I said, that the nuclear non-proliferation system, uh, which was established uh, some 30, 40 years ago, has been built up. Um, it is based upon an essential bargain between the nuclear haves and the nuclear have-nots. Um, and the nuclear have-not states, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty of 1968, uh, are guaranteed access to so-called peaceful nuclear technologies so long as they agree to comprehensive international safeguards over all their nuclear facilities. And in exchange, the nuclear halves, the five original nuclear weapon states, the U.S., China, Britain, France, and Russia, have agreed uh, not to assist any other country in developing nuclear weapons, and they also have committed to pursue the elimination of their own nuclear stockpiles. So the problem with this proposal that George Bush uh, announced in July 2005 with India is that it would grant India the benefits of being a member in good standing of the nuclear non-proliferation system and the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, even though India has not subscribed to all of those standards and principles. India uh, acquired the nuclear bomb, uh, conducted its first nuclear test in 1974 using technology that was transferred to it by the United States and Canada under peaceful auspices. Uh, since then, India has been frozen out of the international civil nuclear technology and nuclear fuel market. So what George Bush has proposed to do and has succeeded uh, recently in, in jamming through the Congress and the International Nuclear Suppliers Group is to grant India a waiver from standards that were established after 1974 when India popped off its bomb test that excluded India from the international civil nuclear market because it doesn't allow comprehensive safeguards, because it has nuclear weapons, because it has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it has not even done things that the United States has agreed to do, such as stopping the production of bomb material that's highly enriched uranium and plutonium, 
and it has not agreed to a legally binding ban on further nuclear testing. So in my view and in the view of a lot of others uh, dealing with these issues, this is uh, blowing a huge loophole in the global nonproliferation system that's going to make it harder to persuade the Irans and the North Koreas, an already difficult task, to abide by their obligations, and it's going to make it more difficult to strengthen this global nuclear nonproliferation effort, which is already uh, fraying at the seams or fraying at the edges, um, and it's something that the next president is going to have uh, have to do in order to uh, build up international security and stave off the spread of nuclear weapons. Um, so, so forgive me for for maybe channeling uh, George Bush here, but but presumably the argument on on uh, the other side um, is that. You know, India does not pose a threat. India is a great ally of the United States. It's the world's largest democracy. Why should they be excluded from what is essentially just a civilian transfer of technology? We're not giving them, you know, know-how, of, 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 or, or, or we're not, you know, selling them nuclear weapons. We're giving them civilian nuclear power. Right. Why? Why is that such a problem? Well, India is a great nation. It's the world's uh, most populous nation. It's a democracy. Uh, it already has very good ties with the United States and many other countries. Uh, it has a uh, fairly responsible foreign policy. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, nuclear weapons uh, are dangerous in the hands of good guys or in the hands of bad guys. Uh, India has not, in its past, abided by the rules. And India, unlike almost every other country in the world, has nuclear weapons, and it's building up its nuclear weapons arsenal. It has refused to uh, take on the same responsibilities as the other nuclear weapons uh, possessors are expected uh, to uh, restrain the growth of their nuclear weapons program. So, I mean, this is setting a, uh, a dangerous precedent, as I said before, that's going to make it more difficult to persuade those countries that are in the system to continue to abide by the rules. Uh, it's going to make it more difficult to strengthen the rules to prevent the most sensitive and dangerous technologies, especially those that relate to making nuclear bomb material from being spread to other countries. The other thing that I think is uh, not very well known and that the Bush administration uh, really ignores and, and, and slides over is the fact that if the United States and other nuclear weapon suppliers provide nuclear fuel to India, what that's going to do is indirectly assist its own nuclear bomb program. You say, how is that going to happen? Well, India has a limited supply of uranium for its bomb production program as well as its relatively small number of nuclear power reactors. Today it's got to divide up how it uses that finite amount of, of uranium. But if we supply India and other countries supply India with nuclear fuel, that is going to free up its domestic supplies for exclusive use in its nuclear weapons sector. This is undeniable. Uh, this is, in our view, a form of indirect support of India's bomb program. In addition, there are some things in this deal that are pretty stunning and amazing that uh, the U.S. negotiators didn't deal with. Um, forgive me for getting a little techie here, but India uh, we, we, we like we like that. You like good. So, okay. so, yeah, so good. Well, go India has it. India has a, a, a nuclear uh, reactor design. Um, is, is primarily used a reactor design called a uh, heavy water reactor, and it uses um, heavy water as the moderating element for the the reactor. Now, one of the things that happens in these heavy water reactors is that a byproduct of the operation is the production of a radioactive gas known as tritium. And tritium is used uh, to boost the explosive yield of nuclear weapons. The United States uses tritium, Russia uses tritium, and India wants tritium in order to boost the explosive yield of the nuclear weapons that it has. And unfortunately, there's nothing in the bilateral U.S.-Indian agreement for nuclear cooperation, nothing in the new Indian IAEA safeguards agreement that prohibits India from taking the heavy water out of its so-called safeguarded reactors and extracting the tritium for, for nuclear weapons purposes. So in our view, the separation of civilian from military uh, nuclear sectors in India is not credible for this reason and some others. So uh, 
the the plan that the Bush administration has put forward is indirectly assisting India's nuclear weapons program. It allows India to use some of these uh, this this assistance in order to continue to build up its arsenal. And you know, I I, I uh, look at this program and 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 I or I look at this proposal and then I I try to imagine how it would look maybe through the eyes of, of foreigners. And then I, I I think you know what if what if uh, China, for example, now that we've sort of now, now that we've we've sort of blown open this loophole, what if, what if China, for example, were to create some sort of uh, civilian nuclear deal with uh, with Pakistan, right? Right. We, right. We, we it would presumably you know we, we would not be very happy about that, given also the fact that Pakistan is sort of a known proliferator through the uh, AQ Khan network. Well, exactly. And, 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 that's, and, this and, is one and, of the big dangers uh, that uh, other countries like China are going to. Uh, try to get similar deals for its preferred strategic uh, or mm-hmm. nuclear trading partners. And the other thing is that because Pakistan understands that this deal is going to help India increase its production of plutonium and highly enriched uranium for weapons, what's it going to do? It is mm-hmm. going to prepare for the worst. It is going to try to accelerate its production of fissile material so its arsenal can expand. We, there's evidence that this is happening already. Uh, there's also evidence that Pakistan is lobbying China and others, France, for uh, uh, preferential treatment on nuclear trade, even though Pakistan has not met all of the standards that nuclear supplier states expect before they engage in civil nuclear trade. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the sort of domestic political forces at work behind this this deal you, you mentioned that that sort of this was president bush's plan but many you know congress approved it and uh you know many many democratic members of congress right. and, and senators also approved it um it, it turned out to be not much of a uh, uh sort of a partisan thing uh correct me if i'm wrong but i i, I do recall seeing maybe an op-ed by some members of Congress railing against this deal. I believe um, uh, Ellen Tauscher right. was one of them, and, and it was co-authored by, by Ed, Markey member of, of Massachusetts. Ed Markey from Massachusetts. Right. That's right. Um, but why, why were so many other Democrats perhaps um, supporting this? Why was this not a, a, a partisan thing? Well, I think you know the overwhelming reason why this is going forward, is, number one, is that uh, there are strong ties between the United States and India. Uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, see India's nuclear arsenal as less of a danger, less of a threat than, for instance, nuclear weapons in the hands of Iran or North Korea. Uh, Be that as it may, the the other reason, I think, is that uh, there is a very strong impulse on the part of many lawmakers, Republican and Democratic, uh, to... Uh, do what they can uh, in order to increase trade between the United States and India, uh, to please the very powerful, increasingly powerful uh, Indian-American business community and the U.S. businesses that uh, hope to expand trade with India. Now, I think a lot of the arguments that have been made along these lines simply don't hold water. Uh, If you take a look at the trade statistics, they're big and getting bigger, and this nuclear cooperation agreement um, really isn't going to affect it all that much. In fact, French and Russian nuclear vendors are probably going to be profiting from this uh, arrangement more than U.S. nuclear vendors. But I think another factor is um, one that we've seen many times and many other issues, which is that uh, some of the lawmakers uh, who are involved in this issue uh, they need to get elected every two years in the House and every six years in the Senate. Uh, and uh, one of, there has been a strong influence, I think, uh, with campaign contributions from some of the Indian American uh, organizations and individual contributors. Uh, I think that has, let's say, lubricated the, uh, the consideration of this deal. Uh, and the Bush administration has pushed very, very hard, put a lot of its... Uh, political capital into this this deal. Now, the big reason the Bush administration is arguing for this is that we need a stronger strategic ally in Asia. India looks to be the perfect ally. Um, Western-type values, uh, English-speaking, democracy, big and growing economy. Uh, The question is, what does that mean 
to have a strong strategic ally in in Asia? Does that mean that we expect China, uh, India to be uh, taking our side uh, in some sort of future conflict or confrontation uh, with China? If so, I think we're deluding ourselves because India has always had a very independent foreign policy. Uh, it needs to maintain good relations in that region. Um, so I think, you know, looking at the reasons that the proponents have given, uh, the arguments for this deal are are exaggerated. Uh, the statistics uh, really and, and the realities don't uh, support them. And I think the downsides are severe. And what we would have liked to have seen is uh, rather than engaging in nuclear trade with India without calling upon or uh, asking it to meet the same standards that even the United States subscribes to, we should have held out uh, and asked or required India to uh, re take the steps that are necessary to rein in its still growing nuclear weapons arsenal, which is uh, a threat to the international community because it uh, helps drive the nuclear arms race with Pakistan and ultimately with China. Uh, so, so we ran into some technical difficulties, but I'll, I'll ask the question again. Um, you know, given these these sort of the, the challenge and, and and the blow to the MPT that this India nuclear deal uh, uh, delivered, um, um, and and also other challenges to the MPT that we've seen over the past few years, I'm wondering if you think it should be scrapped altogether, should be strengthened. What what, what should we do? going forward with the uh, global non-proliferation regime? Well, I mean, some people uh, are critical of the way the, the non-proliferation system has worked. Uh, there have been a lot of problems, but really, we really don't have the alternative of scrapping it. Uh, there's nothing to put in its place. Uh, I think the only real solution, practical solution, is to strengthen it. And what do I mean by strengthening it? I mean, as I said before, the, the non-proliferation system uh, is basically a bargain between the nuclear haves and the nuclear have-nots. Those that don't have nuclear weapons are expecting the nuclear weapon states, uh, especially the United States, to move more aggressively and faster towards the elimination of our still bloated nuclear weapon stockpile. They're looking for the United States to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in our foreign and military strategies. And the role today is still, uh, believe it or not, very much the same as it was uh, during the Cold War years. Uh, the non-nuclear weapon states are also looking to get assistance with respect to uh, nuclear power. There are many countries that are interested, uh, despite the, the problems associated with nuclear power, the nuclear waste problems, the costs, they're looking for the option to uh, develop uh, nuclear power industries. So, on the other hand, the nuclear weapon states uh, need to do more to fulfill their end of the bargain, but we also need to see the non-nuclear weapon states uh, meeting their obligations. We need to see more countries uh, meeting their obligations to uh, comply with safeguards and to agree to a new type of safeguards uh, protocol that was established in the 1990s after the, uh, the first Gulf War when uh, shortly after which we found out that Iraq was pursuing nuclear, a nuclear weapons program. Uh, that's called the Additional Protocol. Still a number of countries have not signed on to the Additional Protocol, which gives the International Atomic Energy Agency greater authority to inspect beyond the uh, officially listed sets of nuclear facilities in those countries. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we need, and all countries need, is we need to find ways to persuade new countries uh, not to build domestic uh, indigenous plants to enrich uranium or to reprocess spent fuel which can allow someone to extract plutonium which can be used for nuclear weapons. This is the problem with Iran. Iran says it's pursuing a nuclear uh, energy program and it needs, it says, uranium enrichment in order to produce the fuel for those reactors. Well, that enrichment program also allows it to uh, potentially build highly enriched uranium, manufacture highly enriched uranium that could be used for weapons. So we need to find ways to mm -hmm. strengthen the system in these and other ways. And then the other thing I think we need to mark is we need to find some, some longer-lasting solutions to some of the regional security problems that drive proliferation. 
the tensions in the Korean Peninsula have existed for over five decades uh, until we address North Korea's paranoia and its fears, it is going to continue to want to hang on to its nuclear weapons capability. Until we find some reasonable solutions to some of the tensions in the Middle East, uh, Israel, of course, is going to maintain its nuclear weapons arsenal. Iran is going to want to keep the at least the option to build nuclear weapons. So uh, part of the solution to non-proliferation goes well beyond the treaties and the export controls on the sensitive technologies, but it goes to solving the regional problems that drive countries to think about and sometimes pursue nuclear weapons. Um, I, I, I guess sort of the, this, this sparks sort of maybe two thoughts or two questions in my mind. One, going, going back to this idea of, of additional measures and, and additional treaties or, or, or ways to convince uh, potential civilian nuclear states not to enrich their own uranium. Right. Uh, there's there's this uh, proposal out there, and, and uh, by the uh, Nuclear Threat Initiative, I believe, which I should offer as a disclosure, is um, a sister organization to the United Nations Foundation, which sponsors my blog, UN Dispatch. And I've read on their on their site that that, that they are proposing this this nuclear fuel bank right. idea, right. whereby um, sort of it's some international agency, presumably the IAEA just has a stockpile of, of enriched uranium that can be used uh, as something of an insurance uh, against countries not being able to import their uh, enriched uranium if they can't process it domestically or if they don't want to process it domestically, right. which is sort of the goal, I guess, of, of nonproliferation. What do you, I guess maybe you could probably explain that idea better than I, and I'm wondering what you think of it. Well, I mean, the, the problem uh, is, is that uh, today we have about 12, maybe 13 countries with the capacity to enrich uranium or separate plutonium from spent fuel. Uh, each one of those countries either is a nuclear weapons possessor or is a virtual nuclear weapons country in the sense that these countries have the technical and the industrial capacity to produce the key material for nuclear weapons the fissile material, high enriched uranium or plutonium. So the challenge is how do we persuade additional states against uh, acquiring that capacity? And let me just explain what the, the challenge is because, as I said, we've got a global energy uh, uh, crisis of sorts. Uh, countries are hungry for new forms of nuclear energy, uh, uh, other, other forms of energy, and so... There are several countries that want to uh, either get into the market of selling nuclear fuel or even getting into the market of selling uh, the services uh, related to uh, producing uh, nuclear fuel for reactors. And so that is creating uh, pressure in countries like South Africa, Argentina, uh, Canada to build domestic uranium enrichment uh, capacity. Um, those countries are not really the problem countries, let's say. These countries are not uh, high risk for pursuing nuclear weapons. But there are other countries that could be high risk if they want to get into this business or if they want to have uh, their own capacity to produce nuclear fuel for power reactors. Many of these countries are in the Middle East, uh, like Saudi Arabia, uh, for instance. So this scheme of having a nuclear fuel bank, uh, which is a, really an old idea, has uh, is getting a re revived. Uh, the proposal is to guarantee all of these countries that might want to get into the nuclear uh, fuel market or want to get into the nuclear energy business uh, that they will have a assured supply of nuclear fuel. And the idea is that this will help persuade them that it is not economically viable or necessary to have their own domestic enrichment capacity. The problem with this idea, as I see it, is that it is only going to persuade those countries that don't have a strong economic interest uh, to get into the enrichment business uh, to do so. It's not going to solve the problem with countries that might want to uh, build up a nuclear weapons capacity, like Iran or even a Saudi Arabia that wants to have an enrichment capacity because Iran has an enrichment capacity and possibly the nuclear weapons program. 
So this is, I think, a partial solution to a big problem. The other part of the solution, I think, has to be uh, better, stronger, tighter controls on the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technologies so that additional countries don't acquire these capabilities. Uh, some people uh, believe that's discriminatory, especially in the developing world. Um, I say that's tough <laughs> because these technologies are not necessary for a country to develop uh, a nuclear energy production industry, especially if you have these nuclear fuel banks, uh, fuel bank idea available. Uh, and it is very clear that every case of uh, nuclear proliferation, every new entrance to the uh, nuclear weapons club has entered that club uh, as a result of getting enrichment or processing technology under peaceful auspices and then they've turned around and used it for a weapons program. That's what India did, that's what Pakistan did, that's what North Korea did. Hmm. So I, I, um, I, I want to talk to you maybe a, a bit about how sort of international diplomacy that's aimed at removing uh, nuclear programs already in place, like in Iran and in, in mm -hmm. North Korea. It seems that sort of the, 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 the model is uh, security, uh, security Council sanctions uh, plus the sort of enticement of, of concessions by, by certain uh, states. And the, the Europe is dangling concessions before Iran, and, and the United States essentially you know, offered a series of concessions to North Korea after already having imposed Security Council sanctions on, on, on North Korea. I'm wondering, is that formula uh, workable? Does it work? What, what do you think needs to be done uh, sort of dipl diplomatically to, to reduce the, uh, the, the nuclear threat from these two countries and, and others going forward? Well, I mean, each, each case is a little different. Uh, let's take North Korea first. Uh, I mean, North Korea has had a, a nuclear weapons program now for almost two decades. Um, we had North Korea's nuclear weapons program contained uh, prior to uh, 2002. Uh, there was an agreement that was established in 1994 between the United States and North Korea that froze its plutonium program. It has a weapons program based on plutonium. Uh, and in exchange for North Korea allowing inspectors into its Yongbyon facility, the United States was uh, and others were supplying heavy fuel oil shipments uh, to North Korea. It's desperate for energy, um, as, as well as um, uh, aid and investment from South Korea. The Bush administration came into office very skeptical of this approach, very skeptical of the Clinton administration's policy of engagement. Um, there was a tough talk in 2001-2002. Uh, 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 the North Koreans became very nervous. Uh, at the first meeting between the United States uh, and, uh, and, and North Korea during the Bush administration in the fall of 2002, the United States uh, representative accused the North Koreans of violating this 1994 agreement known as the Agreed Framework by pursuing a secret uranium enrichment program. Now, at the time, the evidence we had uh, was thin. Uh, in retrospect now, it looks even thinner. Uh, regardless, it does seem as though North Korea was dabbling in this, this area, which would have been a violation. But the question is, should the Bush administration have pressed the North Koreans on this in the way they did. Because right after this meeting, after this accusation the North Koreans were pursuing uranium enrichment, the United States persuaded Japan and South Korea to join us in cutting off heavy fuel oil shipments. And so in January of 2003, the North Koreans said, that's it. You've violated your commitments under this agreed framework. We are pulling out of it. We're going to kick out the inspectors. We're going to resume the production of plutonium for weapons. And ever since then, the United States has been trying to put the North Korean nuclear genie back in the bottle. And North Korea has expanded its capacity, uh, uh, its, its supply of plutonium for nuclear weapons. It popped off a nuclear test uh, in October of 2006. Uh, it appears as though we're back on track here with basically the formula that the Clinton administration had put together uh, back in 1994, 
uh, but with North Korea committing, at least uh, verbally, to eliminating its entire program. We're stuck on some of the key issues that um, uh, were worked out in this, this new framework, which is known as a six-party process. Um, the North Koreans at this moment are saying that the United States has reneged on its commitments, to uh, one of which is to take North Korea off our state sponsor of terrorism list. They are taking action right now to rebuild uh, the, the reactor complex and the plutonium reprocessing facility that they had just allowed the U.S. to verifiably dismantle earlier this year. So there are ups and there are downs. I think this approach, however, is the only approach available, the approach of sanctioning North Korea, telling them what to do, trying to cut off economic aid, is not going to persuade this extremely paranoid, already isolated uh, country from mm -hmm. moving away from nuclear weapons. We need to take a step-by-step -step approach, uh, an action-for-action action process. Mm -hmm. It's going to be long, it's going to be hard, but that's what needs to be done. Now, Iran well, is a different situation because Iran is much wealthier. It is engaged in uh, trade, especially selling oil and oil products to all sorts of nations. It is harder to uh, sanction Iran and to use sanctions and economic levers in order to uh, persuade Iran to suspend its uranium enrichment program. Uh, so, but I think the, the key difference is that the Bush administration, despite some of its rhetoric, has not engaged with Iran in the same way that it engaged with North Korea. Uh, we have outsourced our diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Iran to the European Union. Uh, they uh, put together, as you said before, an incentives package back in uh, 2004, 2005 uh, that did not at the time have the strong backing of the United States. The Iranians rejected that package at the time, I believe because they didn't know if the United States was going to be backing it up. They were still worried about the Bush administration's regime change approach uh, to these um, axis of evil situations. And uh, we have been struggling ever since 2005, 2006 to get these negotiations back on track. And the problem is that um, the United States and the EU now have told Iran, if you do not suspend your uranium enrichment program, and it is gradually progressing, uh, we will not engage in uh, fulsome negotiations with you about a comprehensive approach to uh, solving the, the nuclear crisis and dealing with other issues. The Iranians have said, well, okay, uh, we're not going to stop our uranium enrichment. Uh, we're willing to talk. Uh, and in this situation, the Iranians win because they continue to add centrifuge after centrifuge to their uh, Natanz facility. Uh, they are perfecting the knowledge and the capability to enrich uranium. They're still, uh, by our estimates, uh, some four or five years away from having a substantial quantity of uh, highly enriched uranium for weapons. Uh, that facility is being safeguarded at the moment, uh, but this is a dangerous situation. And I think that what has to shift is we do need to um, engage in a comprehensive negotiation with the Iranians um, without the precondition of Iran suspending its uranium enrichment program. That needs to come later. I hope that will come later. But we can't hold up the negotiations to this demand that the Iranians are obviously uh, not going to, uh, to give in to at this, at this time. So, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Well, I'll say, so presumably, you know, this, this is what um, – uh, candidate Obama means, uh, you know, when, when he says we're going to we're going to talk to the Iranians without precondition. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, going forward, uh, how how can the next president, what steps can the next president do to shore up uh, what what seems to be a, a, a flailing nonproliferation regime, either either candidate or both candidates? Well, I mean, I, I think one of the first problems they have to deal with is just the two that we've been talking about. They've got to make sure that the North Korean and the Iranian nuclear programs uh, don't become bigger threats than they are today. The North Korean situation is salvageable. Uh, it's going to be very difficult. And I would, in fact, urge McCain or Obama to pick up where the Bush administration has left off. 
Uh, this is a, a decent, it's an imperfect, but it's a decent framework, the six-party process, uh, to, to continue pursuing. Um, a lot can be accomplished with some changes in uh, style and rhetoric. Uh, the Bush administration's uh, axis of evil approach uh, did not sit well with the North Koreans. It's the kind of uh, rhetoric that does not make diplomacy uh, work so well in that, that region. With Iran, uh, you know, I think the Obama approach is the right approach. We need to change uh, tack here because the Bush administration's policy of imposing limited sanctions on uh, entities in Iran, while I think smart, is not effective enough. It is not going to uh, uh, adjust Iran's behavior in time to prevent them from having a substantial enrichment capacity. Uh, so uh, what is the diplomatic solution? What does the package look like? There are you know, six ways to Sunday uh, in terms of the ideas that are out there for how to do that, but the first step is to engage in a broad-based negotiation with them. Um, this is a regime that's not led by Akhmanejad. Uh, it is um, led by a, a variety of different people, and part of the problem we have today is, you know, identifying who it is uh, that is in, who's in charge, where the power centers are, and that negotiating process, I think, alone will help us figure out who those people are and what kinds of levers uh, we need to be using uh, to get the right outcome. More broadly, what the next administration needs to do, I think, is to uh, have the United States play more of a leadership role in reducing the value and the role and the number of U.S. nuclear weapons. We are not going to have the credibility in the years ahead to persuade the South Africas and even the Canadas from acquiring uranium enrichment capacity uh, or persuading the Iranians to turn away from nuclear weapons uh, or persuading other countries from allowing more intrusive IA EA inspections unless the United States fulfills the basic bargain that uh, we made in the 1968 Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty to move towards the elimination of our own nuclear arsenal. And we all have to remember that, you know, even though we're 20 years beyond the end of the Cold War, the United States deploys some 4,000 long-range uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, 4,000 warheads right now could be fired against Russia or some other enemy. Russia has a comparable number. Why in the world do we have that many nuclear weapons? I cannot see, nor can many other people see, a uh, legitimate practical purpose for having such a large nuclear weapons arsenal. And the faster we can move to eliminate those bloated arsenals, I think the more credibility we're going to acquire in the international arena to win support for stronger and tighter controls on the most sensitive nuclear technologies to crack down on the black market networks of uh, suppliers that uh, can help fuel the Ill illicit programs of uh, you know, the next uh, Iran out there. Uh, that is one of the most important things that we can do is to lead by example. One of the other things that we need to get back to, I'll, I'll mention too, is uh, we need to ratify the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which is also an old idea, but still a very valuable and important one. Nuclear For the record, that was on the list of things I was going to ask you about. So, sure. So, 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 you know, go on. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on uh, how that can happen and why that's important. Well, we heard about the, the Test Ban Treaty again when uh, Joe Biden... Uh, accused uh, John McCain of voting against the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty back in 1999. This is a question that came up in the vice presidential mm -hmm. debate. And John McCain did vote against the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty along with uh, 51 of his uh, fellow senators, mainly Republicans. Uh, back in 1999, the Clinton administration put together a very poor effort to win uh, the Senate's advice and consent. You need to have 67 votes to uh, win support for ratifying a treaty. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is important because banning the bang prevents existing nuclear countries from perfecting new types of nuclear warheads. Uh, it also uh, prevents uh, would-be nuclear weapon states from 
perfecting the most uh, sophisticated types of nuclear warheads, smaller nuclear warheads that can be delivered on ballistic missiles. So banning nuclear testing is an important way to limit the uh, advance of nuclear weapons programs by a variety of countries. Uh, the McCain campaign has said that uh, as, as President McCain would reconsider the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. That's a good thing. I'm skeptical that he would be enthusiastic about pursuing ratification, but he said that he would reconsider. The Obama campaign has said that uh, a President Obama would pursue as soon as practicable the ratification of the CTBT. The Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is seen by the world's other countries as the most important symbol of the United States' commitment to fulfilling its own nuclear disarmament obligations. Mm -hmm. And that single action would have a great deal of value in trying to persuade others to, to strengthen other parts of the nonproliferation system. Uh, it's today a, a verifiable treaty. We can figure out whether a country is trying to conduct a nuclear test explosion. Uh, we can detect it very low yields. And many opponents say, well, can we maintain our own nuclear weapons arsenals in the absence of nuclear testing? Well, we've done it since 1992, which was the last time the United States conducted a nuclear test blast. Uh, we have the world's most sophisticated, deadly arsenal. We've been maintaining it with a very expensive uh, stockpile stewardship program uh, that can continue working as it has uh, for still decades to come. So this is a, a treaty that's valuable, it's verifiable, and the United States can afford to maintain its uh, nuclear arsenal even without uh, nuclear testing. And there's one other thing that we need to do that I think is very important on nonproliferation and disarmament, and that is to get back on track with Russia on controlling U.S. and Russian strategic nuclear weapons. As I said, we've got each of us about 4,000 deployed strategic nuclear warheads. Uh, there is an important agreement that is about to expire in December of 2009, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Uh, now, even though the U.S. and Russia are far below the numerical limits that were established by the START Treaty, as it's called, uh, the START Treaty provides very important verification and monitoring mechanisms to allow the U.S. and Russia to understand how many missiles we have, how many warheads, um, and it allows for on-site inspections. Given how badly U.S.-Russian relations are going across a variety of areas, it would be a huge mistake to allow this treaty to expire. And yet the Bush administration and the Putin Medvedev administration have not figured out a way to extend this treaty or to negotiate a new treaty that would, would replace it. And so this has got to be one of the top priorities for a McCain or an Obama administration to make sure that the U.S.-Russian strategic nuclear relationship uh, does not become even more unsteady in the absence of any agreement that allows us to understand uh, how many nuclear warheads and missiles the other side has. Well, that was, I think, a very comprehensive answer. Uh, Daryl Kimball, thank you so much for, for chatting with me today. Um, My pleasure. And, uh, you know, we'll put all these links up to uh, up on uh, the, the, the sidebar of, uh, of this program. And uh, thanks, thanks so much. This was great. All right. I'll be happy to do this any time in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, us. and and you know, as as I think these issues come up in the news, I'll definitely want to you know come back to you and, and, and talk about them. But this was really this was really interesting. Thank you.